this weary soul, this vagabond. And I tried with all my might, and I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. Means what he did for none. He can do it again. 
That means what he did for another. He can do it again. That means what he did for another. He can do it again. That means what he did for another. He can do it again. The testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. It's a spirit of prophecy. It's a spirit of prophecy. That means what he did for another. He can do it again. That means what he did for another. He can do it again. That means what he did for another. He can do it again. That means what he did for another. He can do it again. So we sing. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up. Get up out of that grave. Great, great, great. 
For just a brief moment, we want to welcome you this morning to the chapel, Jonesboro. If it's your first time, we welcome you home. If it's your first time watching online, we welcome you home as well. Can we go ahead and give all of our online audience a welcome in-house this morning? We are so thankful that you're able to tune in that way. Hey, do me a quick favor. If it is your first time online, there's going to be a QR code that pops up on your screen. Scan that at any point. You can go back and rewatch it and scan it. We just want to get a little bit of information about you guys and be able to welcome you to the chapel, Jonesboro. As we transition into our giving this morning, I want to remind us of all of the ways that you can sow into the chapel, Jonesboro. If you're watching online, you could do so via Cash App. That's money sign, the chapel, Jonesboro. Or you can mail your tithes and offerings to 1565. Commercial Court, Jonesboro, Georgia. If you're in-house, you can use Cash App as way. That seems to be the most popular way to give. Or in just a brief moment, a Connections team member will come around with the bucket so you can give your gift that way. Or at the end of service, we'll have someone at the double doors with a giving kiosk accepting all forms of debit and credit cards. Like we say every single week as you stand on your feet in this place this morning, there is no reason to withhold from God. Amen? There's no reason because God does not withhold from us. Even when you feel like you don't have, God says, I've already given you everything you need for the moment and the season that you're in. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for what you're doing in this place this morning. God, Lord, we pray over every giver, every sower, every tithe payer, anybody, God, who is going to plant a seed into your house this morning. We ask, Lord, as they release this morning, you release back into their lives, Lord, everything that they need more than they could ask, think, or imagine according to your word and your will. In the name of Jesus, amen. So when I lock eyes with you I see my reflection when I lock
us to take just another minute and I want you to tell him all I want is you Lord all I want is you Jesus nothing else matters nothing else is in, of any value but you Lord come on take just a minute just a minute lift your hands up Father, I thank you this morning, God, Lord, that your presence is in this place, Lord, that the anointing that makes preaching easy is in this house, that, Father, your word says you inhabit the praises of your people, and this morning, we feel your habitation in this house. God, there is a presence of release in the atmosphere, and I thank you for that this morning. Now, Father, I call down every distraction, every agenda, everything that is electronic that is not working correctly, that it begin to work in order this morning. Lord, in our lives today, in our situations, I call down these things. I, I speak to the devil that his plan has been defeated. And Lord, that you would have your way in this service at this time in Jesus' name. Look around you, greet someone, tell them I'm glad to see you here this morning. Hey man, you can take another minute. It's all right. We're in no hurry to get to where we're going today. You know, as I look around this morning, I see a, a lot of empty seats today. And it prompts me to ask the question. Perhaps many are out of town traveling. Perhaps many over eight during Thanksgiving. Uh, perhaps there are some shopping this morning. Perhaps there are people that just said, I'm going to take a break. It's been such a long week that I'm going to take a break. But I want to ask you the question today, uh, does God ever take a break? Does Jesus ever sleep? But yet we do. So today, I, I miss those that aren't here, but I thank you for those that are here today. Because God has given me a word. It's found in Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. I'm going to give it to you one more time. Acts Chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. And when you get there, somebody say, make haste. See, because I'm getting there. <laughs> she said, I'm just flipping through the word. Acts. I don't know what she said. Acts chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. Verse 4 of Acts chapter 12. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison, delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after the Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. There were some intercessors going on. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord. We're going into December, and we're going to hear a lot about angels. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison and he struck Peter on the side raised him up saying arise quickly and his chains fell off his hands then the angel said to him gird yourself tie on your sandals and so he did and he said to him put 
on your garment and follow me. Let me stop right there for just a moment and take a break in this scripture because I, I, I caught myself when the Lord began to speak to me that he told, the angel told Peter, put on your garment. You see, your garment is representation as to who you are. You see, so many times we have taken off who we are and put on someone else's garment and tried to walk in someone else's garment. That's just food for thought today. But he said, put on your garment. In other words, Peter, I need you to put on who you are. So he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that led to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. And I feel like at this time, as I give you the title, my title today is Make Haste. Look at somebody and say, Make Haste. That means uh, let's get it done quickly. That means put on your garment. That means get yourself ready. That means stop making excuses. That means stop giving the cry baby or the cry attitude. So I feel like I need to go before the Lord again and say, Lord, let's pray. Spirit of the living God today, I ask you to fall fresh on us in this house today, God. Anoint us and saturate us, God, with the kind of anointing that enables us to teach and receive this word that you have given us today. God, give us today. Give me nimbleness, God, of thought today that I might flow, hallelujah, in the realm of the Holy Spirit and be able to bless your people. And you see, somebody needs to say thank you, God. Thank you, God, because you see, you may not be where you are, are but you're not where you were. Do I need to say that to you again? You may not be where you're going to be, but I thank you, God, that I'm not where I used to be. That I may not have possessed the land, but I sure have left the desert. That I have come out of the wilderness, and my feet are still wet from crossing the Jordan. You see, because the Bible says, He that hath begun a good work in us shall perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. So you see, God's not doing, uh, not done doing what he's doing in your life. Oh, look at somebody say, he's not done with you yet. You ought to be glad that he's not done with you yet. <laughs> you ought to be glad this morning. So I dare somebody to praise him because you're not, or you're not finished yet. I dare somebody to say, you know what? I'm better today than I was yesterday. I dare somebody to say, you know what? I had a rough week this week, but Sunday's here today. I dare somebody to say, I've been through hell and high water, but today I'm rejoicing and I'm praising the Lord. I dare somebody today to say, I've got breath in my lungs today. I didn't feel like worshiping you yesterday, but God, I'm going to praise you today. Somebody help me preach in this house today. Somebody help me glorify the Lord in this house today. Somebody say I'm praise God I'm happy that I'm not where I was yesterday so you see in this scripture I began to look at it because I preached this numerous times and God has brought me back to it again and you know I never question God why he brings me back because so many times do we question him why he brings us back to a certain situation look at somebody and say I just got out of that but in this scripture, and I know you don't like to do that, but you know what? You don't have a problem eating food in front of them. Hello? But in this scripture, we're looking at something that I noticed. We're looking at passive and aggressive faith. You see, because the church had become aggressive, so Peter could become passive. The scripture said that the church was praying. They were interceding. And what that says is it says that when you 
cannot pray for yourself. There is somebody that is praying for you. When you cannot get yourself up, there's somebody praying that you're going to get yourself up. When you can't get it out of your mouth, you see, that's the church's responsibility. That's why we have intercessory prayer in here on Sunday morning because there's somebody that goes in that room next door and says there's somebody coming into this house today that they're not strong enough to get through it, but bless God, I'm going to pray and I'm going to believe that God is going to bring them through it. Oh, do you feel what I'm feeling in here? And you see, the church has become aggressive so Peter could become passive. You see, intercession takes the burden off of you. It says, go to bed, I got this. Oh, so Peter, there he is. He's kind of like asleep, kind of like some of us this morning. And the very thing, and I thought it odd, the very thing that he criticized Jesus for doing in the boat, now Peter is snoring. That's a few scriptures over. That same Peter that was in a storm and said, Care us thou not that we perish. How can you be sleeping, Jesus, in the middle of a storm? The same guy. Kind of like some of us, isn't it? One day you're up and one day you're down. But now Peter has matured. That's a word that some of us need to understand. And he has become, in essence, an atheist as to what he criticized about, and now he's going to snore. Oh, come on. Have you ever had anybody judge you? Not in this house. Oh, well, yesterday you was up on top of the mountain, but today you in the valley. What happened to your Christianity? Come on. But you see, Peter's sleep was a moment to the magnitude of his fate. This is the same Peter that would normally freak out in a storm and goes around screaming at Jesus is now in the storm of his life. And what does he know that makes him rest when others are beginning to faint? What, does, what, does it, what is it that makes him calm when others are in a crisis? What does he know that makes him able to bear a storm that he couldn't stand a few pages ago? What is it that he's gotten a hold of? You see, perhaps you need to catch this. He has learned how to have faith in a sinking boat so he can have faith on a dry land. Hello. You see, that's how it is sometimes. You, God gets you through the circumstance, but you forget he got you through the circumstance. And you continue to cry. But there he is. You see, look at how he's grown to rest in Jesus. So you see, Passive faith is still a radical faith. It is that calm faith that, oh, come on, have you ever had surgery done? An anesthesiologist comes in there and they anesthetize you. Somebody know what I'm talking about? They numb you up. They numb you up. They get you to a plate, a place that you, you're not feeling the pain. It, 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 it tranquilizes your feel. Come on, you ever seen them shoot a big animal now? With a tranquilizer, I can't get it out right, but I got it close. But it brings you into a state of solidarity. It, it, it's it's a what I want to call a magnificent faith. It's that kind of faith that makes you take the jawbone of an ass and kill 10,000 Philistines. Both of them are working simultaneously in this text. And while Peter is asleep in, the Bible says that the angel appears and when passive faith clutches hands with aggressive faith, an angel begins to, to, to appear. It was, what did I say? The church was praying over here and Peter was sleeping over there. Peter was passive and the church was aggressive. And that, as a result of the church being aggressive and Peter being passive, understanding what God had already done in the middle of a storm. God sends an angel. You see, some of you get caught in the middle of that and you miss what God is sending to you. You miss what he's giving to you. And it's not like the angel knocks at the door of the prison and says, excuse me, I have a FedEx package for you. We have a delivery for you. I hope none of those packages were yours that was on the news yesterday that they found on in Noonan in the woods. Truckloads. You see, God's not that type of God. If he has something for you, it's going to get delivered. 
But you see, God never has to have anybody else's permission to step into your situation. He doesn't knock. He just appears. And somebody today, you're waiting on God to ask your permission, and it ain't going to happen that way. Hello? Well, God, if you will do this, and God says, no, 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 no. Don't put a demand on me. He said, I need you to release yourself so I can work in your situation. You see, uh, many of us are putting a demand on God when God is saying, you're not what, doing what I told you to do to begin with. Oh, am I preaching today? You see, and all of a sudden, there's a light that is standing over Peter. And the angel is kind of rough with Peter. He kind of slapped Peter upside the head and he said, get up, he says. He said, I didn't come for your comfort. I came for your crisis. I'm going to wake you up, but it's not going to be what you think. He said, get up. He said, get up. And he says something crazy for an angel. He says, my title today. He says in the King James Version, he says, make haste, Peter. We got to go. So why is the angel in a hurry? He's not scared. You see, the king's business requires haste. <laughs> oh, come on. God's not a lazy God. I don't know if you caught that. God is not lackadaisical in anything that he does. God is an on-time God, but you see, it requires our action in order to move what he is already doing in your life. You see, God is trying to do something in your life, and you're laying there waiting on him to pick you up. When God says, when you will make haste, I will change your situation. And you see, if you're looking for God to do it, you can't be lethargic. In other words, you, 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 well, you know, it's going to happen. Have you ever met anybody like that? Oh, God, you bless me, and you haven't done anything for God to bless you. God's going to bless me. God's blessed you, but what did you do with your blessing? Hello? God's been better to you than you have to him, and what did you do with what he did for you? Oh, well, God, help my marriage. Can I tell you, it makes me sick sometimes when I counsel with a couple and try to help them with their marriage, and their marriage gets back together, and you never see them again until the wife is running around or till the husband is running around, and then they call and they say, PD, can you counsel with me? No, I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm tired of bailing people out that won't bail their self out. If you're not willing to take the bucket and get down in the center of the bucket, and dip your own water out. Don't ask me to plunge your toilet. Hello. I'm not your wife's husband, and I'm not your. Mm. Let me just help you with that. But that's the way we operate with God, that's the way we do God. That's how much what we expect from God. God's not Santa Claus. You see, you cannot be like, I'm thinking about it, but I'm just not sure yet. I'm working on it. I'm gradually going to come around, and eventually I'm going to come out of, of this prison, and, and, and I'm going to be mighty. God, He says, make haste. You see, church, when you get the grace to get out of something, you got to make haste. When God says it's over, you got to make haste. When God says, I'm bringing you out right now, don't wait on your pocketbook. Don't call your girlfriend. Don't call your boyfriend. Don't ask your sister or your brother what they think about it. Make haste. Look at somebody and say, make haste. Make haste. Many of you know this story, and some of you don't know this story, but prior to the chapel... We served in a ministry, a ministry that was a great ministry. We pastored a great ministry. Some of you that are here today are a result of that pastoring. But as a result of that, there were many that said, Pastor, it was a, in essence, we've got your back. We're there with you. We're going to help you. Just carry us along. But one by one, they began to fall on their commitment. And eventually it put Pastor in uh, Pastor Sabra in a spot that we had lost everything trying to keep the church alive. Everything. Y'all know the story. And so God says it's time to shut the doors. And we shut the doors. 
And as I shut them doors, some of you remember these words that I said from a pulpit. I want you to go attend a church, and I want you to be a better church member than you were here. That's what I said. And we went and did that. We went and attended a church, and we was the best church member we could be. I wasn't that church's pastor. I didn't walk in there and say, I preach or I do these things. We walked in there and we sat in a seat. We wrote our tithe envelope out. We praised. We worshiped. We got the word. We got fed. And we went home. And we did that for two years straight. In between that time, the pastor there recognized that God had sent someone there that had a call on their life. And he began to come and pour and began to, uh, as a, a sheep that was wounded, he began to pour oil into our lives and under our spirits and to help us through our situation unbeknownst to us. But there was one morning that I got in this shower and I was bathing and I was cleaning because you see, uh, my prayer is God, uh, uh, as I wash the outside, you wash the inside. Lord, uh, reveal to me anything that's not of you that needs to go of you and no sooner did I get out of the shower and get dried off and get my clothes on the, the Holy Ghost spoke to me and he said get up I realized the other day what he was saying was make haste make haste he said get up and I said God I am up have you ever have a, had a conversation with God kind of like you're saying this to me but I already know <clears throat> come on I am up God God says, I told you to get up. And I said, what are you saying, God? God said, it's time for you to step out of what you've been walking into and step back into your call. I have a call on your life, and I have allowed you to take a recess. I have allowed you to become whole. I have allowed healing to come to you. I have sent people around you that have ministered to you. Now it's time for you to get up. And no sooner did I do that and come down those 14 steps that it took to get to the middle part of the house, I walked down and I said, I got to preach this Sunday. I got to be somewhere this Sunday. Go rent me a pavilion at Fayette over here at the park. Get me someplace. Who are you going to preach to? I'll preach to the squirrels. I'll preach to the chipmunks. I'll preach to the drunk that passed out in the park. I'll preach to anybody, but get me a place because God says I got to make haste. I got to go. And in nego negotiation, she said, I'm not doing that. Pastor Saber said, I'm not doing that. You're not going to no pavilion to preach. And the conversation went on for a little bit. And then God spoke again. I'm standing there. Have you ever had God speak to you while you're in the middle of an in-depth conversation? Yeah. He stops the deepness of it and he says, what I got to say to you is more important than what you're saying. And so the next thing you know... God says, call Darren Ford at Ford Stewart. And I said, God, who died? <laughs> you call me back out of what I'm doing to go do what I'm supposed to do. And now I got to deal with somebody dead. Hello. And God said, no, I've got a plan for you, but you need to call him. And you need to ask him, can you use his sanctuary at the funeral home? And the first thing I thought of was, God, how am I going to get people to come there? They, they viewed half of their loved ones at that funeral home. How am I going to get them? Some folks didn't come. But I called Darren Ford and he said, I said, can I rent your sanctuary? Can, can we do? God has spoke to I gave him the whole story. You know, most people would have said, you crazy, man. But I gave it just how God gave it to me. And he said, let me talk to my dad and call you back. And within 30 minutes, he called back. And he says, dad says, come on. He said, when do you want to do it? That was on a Friday. I said, can we be there Sunday morning? He said, yes. Yes. Yes, you can be there Sunday morning. And I, and I said, how much do we need to pay? He said, dad said, it's not going to be anything. You're not going to pay us anything. You're coming. And so about seven or eight of us got there that Sunday morning. We rolled our sound equipment in. We began to preach. And the next thing you know, it started taking off. It would not have taken off had we not made haste. It would not have taken off had I not listened to the Lord. It would, we would not be where we're at today had I not definitely heard the voice of God. And some of you, God has been speaking to you repetitively in your life. And he's telling you to make haste. And you're laying around waiting on the perfect opportunity or the perfect time but I'm telling you today God is telling you to make haste today 
God says you better come out while you can. You better stop trying to be cute and come out while you can. You've got the grace to come out, and you better come out while you can. If you've got the grace, you've got the grace to be healed. You can come out better now than you've ever before. You better take up your bed and walk today. You better stop sitting there and talking yourself and reasoning yourself and making excuses for your own dysfunction. I wasn't raised that way. My daddy did this. My mother did that. This happened when I was a young. You, you see, you're riding on the excuse. You're avoiding the answer because of the excuse. And God says, no, you got to make haste today. You see, because when the anointing comes, somebody say that. When the anointing comes, you got to get out. Look at somebody and say, make haste. You see, either you're going to get over it or you're not. Either you're going to forgive them or you're not. Either you're going to walk in it or you're not. And you see, you got to stop laying around in the mess and talking about, I'm gradually going to get out of this thing. Oh, somebody today, when God's glory shows up in your life, look at somebody today and say, I'm coming out right now. I'm coming out right now. It won't be six months. It won't be six years. It won't be after the holidays. I'm coming out right now. You see, somebody today, you see the grace to come out right now. Oh, I refuse to be slow when God is working fast. He said, as you see the light, come on somebody this morning, walk therein. The day you hear my voice, God says, harden not your soul or your heart. He says, when I send my angels, don't make them have to drag you out of where you're at he says make haste oh i'm preaching to somebody today make haste you got to get out oh somebody say i'm coming out now oh come on you better help me this morning we live in a world that everybody is coming out but the church do you hear me this morning we live in a world that everybody is coming out but the church think you heard me this morning I said this years ago and it just came to fruition the last few days the courts no longer respect the pastors anymore we don't want you we heard it the other day that that didn't make you sick don't nothing make you sick for a man to stand up there and say, I don't want a black pastor in this, in this uh, courthouse. That is repulsive to the body of Christ. And let me tell you something. It's time for the church to come out. It's time for the church. I need to say it louder in this house today. It's time for the church to come out. We've stayed in the gospel closet too long. We have covered up with the gospel garment too long. God says, I want you to put on the garment of strength. I want you to put on the garment of praise. I want you to put on the garment of authority. I want you to put on the garment of healing. I want you to put on the garment that the king has put for you. Oh my Lord. Oh make haste. Make haste. Oh somebody say I'm going to do it right now. Oh, I got the grace to forgive. I'm dropping it right now. I got the grace to build. I'm building it right now. I got the grace to go back to school. I'm going right now. When God puts grace on your life, it has a time and a dimension to it. Oh, you can't do it when I'm fitting to. <laughs> oh, you can't do it when I'm thinking about it, saying stuff like, well, the devil is, we, the church has done that long enough. You've used the devil as a liar for your lack too long. Stop giving him credit for an action you're not willing to take. <laughs> oh, I'm preaching this morning. I, I eat too much turkey or something. You see, I want to give you this. No action equals lip service. Oh. And when the angel shows up, you got to make haste. He said, come out now. And the scripture says the chains begin to fall off while the guards were asleep. Oh, I thought we were connected. And God says, I will bring you out even. Oh, 
Mm. Oh, I, uh, this ain't going to feel good. God said, I'll bring you out. Even those closest to you won't even know what I did when I did it. They'll be sleeping on both sides of you. And I will bring you out. God said, don't wait on a witness. Oh, do you hear me this morning? Oh, somebody said, man, did you hear that? Did you hear that? What do you think about that? Uh, do you think I should get married? Uh, do you think I should buy a house? Uh, do, do you think this? Uh, no, God said, when I speak to you, it's going to be to you. And Paul says, I confer not with flesh and blood. Huh. You see, some of you are waiting for everybody else to feel what you feel. When you feel what you feel. You see, you got to operate between you and God. And when God says make haste, I don't care who you connected to. Make haste. Oh, somebody this morning. God said, I didn't put you in that relationship. God said, I didn't put you in that situation. I didn't connect you to that corruption. I didn't connect you to all that stuff that was going. I, you made the choice to go there. And you've asked me to bless your choice. Mm. You see, I, I, this is marriage 101 today. I just feel like I need to give this out. Or should it be dating 101? Because we got people that can't even date right. Can't even date right. <laughs> if I hurt you, I'm sorry, but I don't apologize. <laughs> I'm just sorry. <laughs> She said, what is that? You said you were sorry. <laughs> sorry and apologies, two different things in my book. I can say I'm sorry all day long. <laughs> but you see, that's the problem we got. People dating. Four or five youngins, and when she can't do nothing no more, you go get another one. And then you talk bad about her when she laid on her back, oh, somebody this morning. But that's what's wrong with us. Find fault in everybody else but yourself. Look at the common denominator here. The common denominator is the one that continues to go back to the same way of life and expect something different out of that same way of life. And God says until you stop going to the same way and come to the way, the truth, and the light, then your life will begin to change. You see, that's the problem with a lot of us. We don't want to put God first. We want to do what we want to do and ask God to bless us. Bless me, Lord. I say, get them, Lord. Get them, Lord. You see, somebody needs to ask yourself today, who am I connected to that's not of God? <laughs> oh, look beside you. Think about it in your life. Who am I connected to that's not of God? Mm. That stung, didn't it? You forced yourself in, and God's not happy with it. Oh, look at somebody and say, I got to go. Because I'm fixing to get you out of here in a few minutes. I got to go. Oh, come on. You got to tell them, you can sleep in this mess if you want to, but I got to go. You can stay in this den if you want to, but I got to go. You can keep on feeling sorry for yourself, but I got to go. Whatever it takes. It's the individual that calls me five times during the week. And they're not willing to get out of their mess. And eventually I tell them, if you're not willing to get out of your mess, stop dragging me into your mess. Stop dragging me into your problem. There's people here today. You're allowing other people to drag you into their mess. And the next thing you know, you smell just like what they're dragging you into. You're chained to their problems. You get a visitation from God to cut you loose, but you snap it back before you can get out. Oh, I'm preaching to somebody today. Maybe in here it might be on the live stream. I don't know. Oh, look at somebody say, I gotta go. I gotta go. Now this is gonna hit hard. But for the next 30 seconds in this building, 
I want everybody, every escapee in here to give God some praise right now that you woke up and realized, I got to go. Oh, come on. 20 seconds in this house. I got to go. I escaped from that thing. Five seconds. Open up your mouth. Touch the person. Transfer the anointing from the left to the right. You see, touch somebody and tell them, you can't stay in what you're staying in. You got to go. You got to get out of this thing. Touch them this morning. Touch them. Come on. We're in a pandemic, Pastor. No, we're not in a pandemic. We're in a state of mind that says it has to be that way. But God said, I visited you. I pulled you out of this thing. You're depressed because you're hooked to depression. You're tied up because you tied it. Might have been good some folks wouldn't hear it this morning. Huh. Oh, you're coming out of this thing. You're going to get back everything. Somebody say everything. Everything that you lost. When you disconnect, you've opened yourself up for God to reconnect. Oh. Everything. Look at somebody say, I'm about to get everything back. Oh, you ain't got enough room for everything you lost. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Everything. Everything. Let me just testify this. Can I testify, baby? Is that all? Can I just give? Yeah, you my baby. Ain't nobody else my baby in this house. Lindsay's my, my, number, my number two baby. Because when I got her, I got her. Hallelujah. Do you hear me this morning? But everything, the repo man drug your car out, God gave you two that don't have a payment. Do you hear what I'm telling you? The house you had to sell because the owner financer did you wrong and beat you out of $90,000. God said, not only am I going to give it back, that was the next house that we went into, that we sold, that we got over and above the 90000 out of it in a profit, living there three years. Do you hear me this morning? Oh, somebody today, everything that we ever lost or had to give up in our life, God has given it back. I'm testifying this morning. He has given it back better than what we had. Better. Look at somebody and say, What I had was all right, but what I'm about to get back is better than the all right. You don't believe me, do you? Three o'clock in the morning. Huh. That girl was with me. They say, till death do we part. No, I say, until glory do we part. And then we go up. <laughs> Three o'clock in the morning. And we hear tires screeching. And she says, somebody's still in my car. And I looked out. I said, they ain't stealing it. We was two payments behind. We went into three yet. You see, Ford Motor Company had a little clause in there. Yeah. They drugged that thing all a brand new car. <laughs> She's still sick now. They drugged that thing up that hill <laughs> to the top. I started to get in it and drive it off the record. But I said, no, 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 no. Don't fight with the man. Just let him take it. Let him take it. <laughs> what am I going to drive, she said. <laughs> what am I going to drive? What am I going to do here? We went and bought a buy here, pay here. Yeah. We made them payments on that thing. We were good to it. And I called one day and I said, you know, I'm not behind, but I need to bring this car back because I can't afford it because I didn't want another wrecker pulling up in the yard. <laughs> yeah. So we washed it up, had brand new tires on it. We took it right back to the place, and they begged us, keep it. Don't worry about paying for it. Keep it. It wasn't mine because it wouldn't have been rightfully mine taking it that way because the contract said I was to pay for it. And so we gave it up. 
<laughs> it gets better. That suburban, that Yukon you driving past the Jalen. I went to Buckhead with the trailer and bought that thing with a blowed up engine in it and brought it home and put an engine in it. I said, there's your car, baby. I've done that before to her. And she drove that thing. It's a good vehicle. It's so good. He's still riding in it. But God was so good. But God said, I want to see you take care of the worst thing in your life. I want to see. And she washed it once a week. That thing was. <laughs> she scrubbed that thing. I don't know how it looks now. but Yes. God said, I want to see you be a good steward over what I got you. I want to see you take care of what I got you. And yeah, come on. Come on, somebody this morning. And she washed it and washed it, and then we upgraded a little bit. I traded a truck for an Acadia that Bailey and Pastor Lee has got. <laughs> she's throwing her hands up. She's still riding 2010 model, needing to put an engine in that thing, and she's still riding in it. We've been to Disney. We've been to everywhere in that thing. But during the time before it got to her, my baby scrubbed it and cleaned it. Twice a week she washed that thing. I'm telling you, when we got it, it had Cheetos in the back. It was trash, but it wasn't long. That thing smelled like the glory of God. Do you hear what I'm telling you? And then we went from that to a Suburban that this family over here is riding in now. Do you hear me, somebody? in this house and it's a good old suburban glory to God but she kept it clean she kept it washed she kept it taken care of but if you look at us now right now PD's not riding in an old beat up truck I have a 2000 what is that thing I got 11 Silverado it is paid for I don't know anything on it I have clear title to it she has a what do you have 2019 Suburban that is paid for, that no money is owed on it, that nothing is owed on it, and she washes it just like that. We have a home right around the corner. Now, oh, do you hear me this morning? I don't want to. I want to tell somebody today: stop staying chained in the place that you're chained in. When God has something for you, God said to take it off. Take it off. You're only connected because of the choice of the connection. I feel like preaching. Look at somebody say, I'm going to get it back. I'm going to get it back. <laughs> the angel said, he said, Peter, put your clothes on. Wrap your garments around yourself. Uh, Peter. Don't st it ain't time to step out yet. Don't get ahead of what I'm trying to tell you. He said, grab your robe. <laughs> you see, that's some of our problem. We move before we have picked up everything that God has told us to pick up. <laughs> uh, you're settling for what you can grab at the time. When God says, I need you to stay, I'm preaching this morning to somebody. I need you to stay where I got you at because there's something that you're leaving behind that is greater than what you're carrying yourself out with. And you see, that's the deal here today. Look at somebody and tell them, I'm going to get all of my stuff back. All of my stuff. Give me my coat. Give me my clothes. Give me my name. Give me my reputation. Give me my joy. Give me my daughter. Give me my son. Give me my house. Give me everything that is mine. When I come out, I'm bringing it all with me. Oh, and all of that was great. But there's something that I noticed in this that I need to give. Peter goes to the gate. They walk down the street. He and the angel. And he said something. Peter said something. Peter said, when I came to myself, when I came to myself, you mean all of that happened and you didn't realize what was going on? You ever had things happen in your life and they happen so quick? And you're like, where did that come from? How, where did that come from? Oh, some, a lot of times it's bad, isn't it? And it, Peter says, I was out before I knew it. Oh, somebody, I was healed before I knew it. I was out of debt before I knew it. I was wealthy before I knew it. I was free before I knew it. I was delivered before I was, oh, come out of this morning, before I knew it. 
I was praising God before I knew it. I had a brand new car before I knew it. I had a better job before I knew it. Oh, somebody today. I had children when they said I wouldn't go to have children. But I was pregnant, glory to God, before I knew it. I'm in my right mind before I could get my mind right. Do you hear me this morning? There's somebody here today. You need to say, before I know it. Oh, hallelujah. I don't see it yet. But God said, I'm leading you out of where you're at. I'm leading you out of what you're stuck into. You're headed from what you were to before you knew it. Before I knew it. Oh, two times in the Bible, that word I came to myself is used. Twice. The second time was the prodigal son. The prodigal son. Y'all remember that? The Bible said he came to himself. The prodigal son came to himself. Having been intoxicated off his own sins and excess, he came to himself to recognize who he was, and thereby he was liberated to leave where he was at to go back to who he was. But Peter was liberated before he knew it. The prodigal son knew it, and therefore he was liberated. Did you catch that? But Peter was liberated before he knew it. And I came to realize that most of the time that God does the most amazing things in your life. And they're done before you know it. <sighs> you walked out of it before you knew it. You got over it before you knew it. You're free before you knew it. You're whole before you know it. You're not afraid anymore before you know it. You can't even tell anybody what really happened because God did it so smoothly. Oh, you see, Peter couldn't differentiate between what he was dreaming and what he was living. He went from dreaming about it to walking in it. And there's some people in this room today, if you give it a moment and you think it about it, you're walking in things that you used to dream about, things that you never could have imagined. I dare you to go back to where you started taking your blessings for granted and go back to the old you who was praying for the new you that you have become today. And I bet you cannot tell me the exact date that it happened. One day it was a dream and next day you were walking in it. Oh, and he says, he came to himself. He said, now I see. I believe it. But now I know it. And when he knew it, the angel disappeared. And that was class dismissed. The whole thing was a class taught by the master instructor. instructor. It was in a controlled environment so that Peter could preach the rest of his life without fear of the jailhouse. I don't think you caught that. What are you saying, PD? I'm saying your situation that you're in, you're in that situation because God says you won't return anymore. God says, I'm going to use your situation that, to teach you that you can still dwell in the house of the Lord dealing with your situation. You can still praise me when it's bad. You can still worship me when you don't feel like it. He said, I'm trying to use you because there is a purpose in your life that you're going to reach some people with. And so he exposed you to take the power from it so that it wouldn't threaten you, so that it wouldn't intimidate you, so that you wouldn't have, it wouldn't have power over you. And the Bible said when the angel disappeared, Appeared, the angel didn't tell Peter where to go. But Peter instinctively went oh, to a house that they were praying in. At that point, he went to the church. You see, we got to stop running to the church when our house is on fire. Hello. I got to get out into the chapel. No, 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 no. God said, I need you to get out on your knees. I need you to get to your place before you go to my place. Oh. So how did he know where to go? You see, so he comes to the house and he knocks on the door. I know Rhoda. I'm glad none of my children were named Rhoda. hope none of y'all's aren't. Rhoda. Hey, girl. Rhoda. She comes to the door and she hears Peter's voice. And they're still in there praying, and they're beating the floor, and they're talking in tongues. They're rebuking the devil, and they're pleading the blood. And Jesus was out before they knew it. Oh, Rhoda goes to the door, and she says, you know, I believe that's Peter. And one of them stopped from speaking in tongues long enough and said, no, no, it can't. It's a ghost. 
It's, it's something else, but it ain't no Peter. Come on. You see, what they were praying for had been answered before they knew it. Peter was out before he knew it, and their prayers were answered before they knew it. And Rhoda tried to tell them, and they wouldn't hear it. And she opened up the door, and Peter was standing there, and they were aghast at it. Now, anybody know anything about Peter? He was like many of us. He was very outspoken. I'm getting ready to close. You see, we got a lot of outspoken people. Do you hear me? And I believe he said, shut up. I believe he said, let me tell you what happened. While you were praying, oh, come on. While you were interceding for me, the angel was invading my crisis. And he said something. Thing, come on. He said something to me and my chains fell off. I was trying to get my clothes on. I was trying to get ready to go and the angel was saying hurry up Peter. Hurry up Peter. You see he wasn't telling him to hurry up because the guards were going to become conscious and see what was going on. He wasn't telling him to hurry up because there was a time frame on the deliverance. He wasn't telling him to hurry up because uh, he had to be somewhere else. He was telling Peter it's time for you to to pick up the pace. It's time for you to start stepping quicker than you used to tell. And God is telling somebody today, it's time for you to pick up the pace. He has opened up these things for you to walk into. And God said, I don't want you to stroll into this next portion of your life. God said, I want you to make some haste. In other words, he said, get your clothes on, get your coat on, and get to what I called you to do. <sighs> he told me to grab my coat. He said, I was walking, but they didn't see me. He said, I walked right through them, and they never saw me. <laughs> well, Peter, didn't they try to kill you? No, I didn't have to fight because I was out of there before they knew it. You see, some of you, you're stopped in your situation, and you're fighting your situation. You're fighting it. God says, why are you fighting in something that I'm trying to pull you out? Why? Oh, it's happening. Why are you fighting? Why are you arguing in something that I'm trying to pull you out of? He said, I was out before I knew it. And he said, I was headed to, to your house before you knew it. He said, that gate at the town, it opened right up. <sighs> Nobody knew it. Nobody knew it but God. You see, I'm trying to tell you today, as you stand to your feet, everything in your life is being orchestrated without you. The scripture says that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And you're walking in them and you don't even know it. And you're about to come into full stature of who you were created to be. Oh, my word. Oh, my word. He said, I heard you plea. I came down to see. Psalmist David said he reached down into the miry pit. I love that. You see, because God's willing to come to where you're at. But God's not willing to leave you where you're at. You see, there's a thing and it's called permissive will. Kind of like, uh, I know what God spoke to me, but this is what I'm going to do. And God says, well, you may think that, but I'm about to put you in a situation that's going to force you to do what I'm going to do in your life. Oh, my. I'll never forget this. Pastor Lee was born month or so early 
poor fella. He didn't have no eyelashes. He had no hair. He looked like E.T. Literally, looked like an E.T. We took him home. And it wasn't just a few days. It was cold. It was coming up on Christmas. And he got sick. We called the paramedics and they came out. We ended up taking him at that time to South Fulton Hospital. And we got there and the first thing they told us is we got to transfer him to Scottish Rite right now. It was snowing. In Georgia, it was snowing. We got to transfer him right now. He may not live. I had a 69 Chevrolet truck. Rust on the bottom, rust in the floor for sale sign on the passenger side to keep them Saber and Lindsay from falling through. And they said, we got to take him right now. Mama, you can ride in an ambulance, but Daddy, you got to figure it out. That old truck, I had pulled it out of the bushes because that was a time in my life that I had lost everything in a prior marriage. I lost it all. Well, let me back it up. I gave it all away because I needed to get it. Every bit of it. That's a story for another day. I had a race car that sat on the trailer, and I pulled the engine out of that car, and I put it in that truck. I said, I got to have something to drive. It's either work or race. I got to go to work. Put that old engine in that truck. Go back to the hospital. That's what I'm saying. I didn't go home and put it in, but I'm trying to take you back to, to explain something. The ambulance said, you try to keep up, up with us, but we're going to go at 75, and we're going to hit 400, and that toll booth, we may lose you. But as soon as you go through, get off the exit at the right and make the next left, and you'll be at the hospital. I said, okay, I got it. We rolled out of that hospital, and they were long gone. And I put that truck on 75, and it wasn't just five minutes, G. An ambulance that was rolling, I was on the back door that night. In the snow. They rolled through the toll booth. And there's cars behind me. I had to drop the quarters in, and I caught them before we got to the exit ramp, which was less than three quarters of a mile. Pulled up in that hospital. I was rolling. I wanted to be there. I had to be there. I got him in there. I started working on him. All these tubes and all of these things, and they didn't give us a lot of hope. We stayed all night long, slept on the floor, and she slept beside him in a tent-shaped bed. And I'll never forget that morning when I got ready to leave. It was early, and I had worked the job, and I needed to be there. And about 5.30 that morning, I rolled down to the front reception desk. And I, I said, you have a great day. And the lady said, you have a child here? And I said, yeah. And I told her the whole situation. She said, he's going to be okay. He's going to be okay. And I said, I hope so. I had already been on my face before the Lord, and I said, God, please let him live. Please, I'll serve you the rest of my life, God. I will commit to you, and I will not fall short of that. I'll do whatever it takes. We've all done that. And we've gotten in the middle of the do whatever it takes, and we've dropped off something. But I can tell you, I've never dropped off. Not one bit. One bit because no sooner did I get to work. We didn't have insurance. We had nothing. I'd started a new job. I get a phone call. And Sabre says, there's a lady come up here and she's got paperwork and says, we're not going to have any bills. We're not going to have to pay anything. I started crying. I worked for Nally Motor Trucks at a truck place. I started crying and I said, oh my God. Days went on. He started getting better and he started getting better. I never faltered. I never faltered. Every Christmas for four or five years, we were in the hospital with him. And then finally, you see, don't allow what impacts you to keep you in the impact. Because if you do, then you stay stuck where you're at and you fall short on what God's called you to do. And I stuck with it. You see him back there today. Y'all have seen him preach. They said he would never run. He would never play sports. He'd never be able to breathe. He'd have asthma. He'd have all these things the rest of his life. All of these things he would have the rest of his life. And I had decided I didn't care what he had. I wanted him to live. I wanted to make sure I kept that commitment. But God has a plan and a purpose for his life. Just like he has a plan and a purpose for your life today. The things you're going through today, the jail cell spiritually that you may feel like you're in, that you're connected and you're bound to, God says, I'm stepping into that. And I'm pulling stuff loose. I'm stepping into that. 
Don't look at what I loosed off of you. You see, that's our problem. We want to focus on what he took off of us and it becomes more valuable than what he's wanting you to put on. And God says, no, 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 no. Oh, how many times have we said, I wish I had that back? I wish I had that back. There's a reason you don't have that back. Perhaps it's because if you did, it would pull you away from God. Perhaps if you did, you may go further into where you were at than you were ever before. I don't know. But this I do know. God says today, make haste. 2021 is coming to an end. This church, we're in a make haste moment. Our leaders, your leaders will tell you this. We're in a make haste moment and God has already spoke to us two months ago. What to do and how to do it and how to do it right. And we have... We have stepped into submission to the Holy Spirit, and we're doing that. And I'm going to tell you something. I believe we're going into an era that there's not going to be a seat left into this building. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Because what he does in your life is going to run over into other people's lives. But today, you got to make haste. So here's the question. Do you have something today that's keeping you from stepping to where God wants you to step? Is there something today... That God says, I've taken it off of you twice, but I'm going to remove it one more time, and I don't want you to pick it up again. If that's you, these altars are open today. I'll have people down here to pray with you. But lately, I've tried to make it a one-on-one because we're codependent on everybody else. We're codependent on everybody else. We want everybody else to get us out of our situation. But God says today, it's up to you. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If that's you this morning, this is not the walk of shame. Let me tell you something. I ride these altars to heaven. When I'm at home, I find a place. A lot of times I'll slip out of the house and I'll go out to the shop. I'm just going to tell on myself. I'll tell her I need to go out there and check this because we might have left it on. And when I get out there, I find a place in that dirty floor. I find a place in that floor that's got grease on it from where I didn't clean up the day before and I get on my face before God and I say God I need to eat today God I need to eat some spiritual food God God I need a release today God I need you to give me wisdom God I need you to give me patience I pray all of these things I'm not exempt church I'm a pastor but I'm not exempt so many pastors exempt themselves from those things God's not pleased with that so today while your heads are bowed Father God I come before you God Lord in this house God I have placed myself at this altar Lord if there's anything be found inside of me today oh Lord I pray that you remove it I pray that you unhook it from me because God when you unhook it I'm going to listen to you God I'm not going to attach it back God, when you lose someone, you lose them. Lord, today there's someone that they feel like Lazarus. They feel like that you brought life to them, but they're still wrapped in a lot of stuff. And God, I believe that if they will step out of that tomb, even with the stuff wrapped around them, that just like you did Lazarus and you said grave clothes, loose him, that they will be loosed. God, that means that there has to be obedience. So, God, I speak today that the spirit of obedience inhabit this place. Fill this place, God. God, no one, we no one, no one knows the hour that you will return, nor do we know the time that we'll pass. So, God, we've had many that we've been separated from this earth on that have gone to glory, that have gone to home. And we'll see them again, but God, we deal with that hurt every day. And God, I ask you today, help us all to deal with that. Help us to deal with the separation of a loved one that's no longer around us today. God, help us, those that are dealing with sickness in their body. God, I speak healing right now. God, I speak a disconnect. 
from the pain and the circumstances that they may carry. God, someone today feels like they're trapped in a situation and they have no choice. God, reveal that choice to them today. Reveal it to them today, Father. God, I speak over. Hey, thank you so much for joining us this morning for our morning worship. We know God impacted your life in a great way. If you enjoyed this service, share this stream to all of your family and friends, and we'll catch you next time here at the Chapel Jonesboro.